Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Leadership Live discussion tonight. I'm Suzanne Jackson Nagy. I'm a member of the Hebrew class of 1990. I'm the proud parent of a student in the class of 2026 and also 2023. And I'm currently the director of enrollment management for the school. And I'm so pleased to join Margaret Wilcox, Margaret McLeod Wilcox. Uh, she was a member of the class of 1992, and she is currently the chair of the Board of Trustees and also has three boys at Heathwood in the classes of 22, 24, and 27. We're also joined tonight by Chris Henchy, our head of school. He is entering his eighth year at Heathwood and sixth as head of school, but he is also the proud father of three boys in the classes of 22, 25, and 27. Thank you to all the families who are joining us tonight. We really appreciate your time, and we look forward to sharing lots of great information with you. I want to thank Sarah Hughes, who is our um, new Executive Director of Institutional Philanthropy, for arranging this conversation tonight. So thank you to Sarah Hughes. The purpose of our time together tonight is really to connect with our constituents. Um, Heathwood is uh, very strong because of the relationships we have with families. And we wanna share all the amazing things that are happening on campus. We'd love to give our current families, alums, grandparents and prospective families a little peek into what's going on at Heathwood because we are very, very proud to share all that we are doing. So I want to thank you for joining us and also for submitting your questions already to Sarah Hughes. So we have lots to get to. So I want to just welcome you, Chris, and welcome you, Margaret. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Suzanne. Sure. Okay, so Chris, this first question is for you. This has been a year like no other for certain. Um, and as you enter your eighth year at Heathwood and six as head of school, Will you just reflect a little bit on the year and kind of help us to know what you've been thinking about and how you intend to move the school forward? Because we have a lot going on. <laughs> well, thanks, Suzanne. I also want to thank Sarah Hughes for uh, pulling this all together and some of the other people working behind the scenes. So I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, this has been a year kind of unlike any other. But then again, I also wonder, it's a lot like some of the others. The, the, the first year I was the head of school, I was, you know, fatiguing at the end of September with the number of kind of welcome events. And as we, you know, I was kind of getting my feet under me um, and I just was telling people, I just need to get through September and then I can rest. And then the flood hit. Um, and so uh, that was baptism by fire in the first year. Um, and this has been a year. Uh, it has been a challenging year at Heathwood. Obviously, uh, what's at the forefront of our minds right now is that we haven't had the chance to spend as much time together as we like because of COVID. Uh, but it's also a year uh, that was marked by the loss of Jay Clarkson uh, and the loss of Molly Roddy. It has been a challenging year uh, for the Heathwood community. And, and so this was a very difficult way to finish the year. It was exciting that we could finish the year on campus with the class of 2020 uh, in a beautiful commencement ceremony. Um, what has gotten us through this year? Uh, to a large degree, it has been kind of thinking of our families. And you know, I recognized how often I think of our families. Uh, when I was in Publix the other day, food shopping, um, as I like to do, it's one of the few tangible jobs I can do where there is a list and you can complete the job. And, and I ran into the Genovese's and if they're out there tonight watching, that's awesome. Um, but I went home and told my wife, Heather, that I realized while I think of you all the time, uh, Maria and Chris, it was like they hadn't seen me in months and they hadn't. Uh, and so I realized that, that we have been afar from each other, uh, but we really have been thinking about our families and our students. Uh, and that has been guiding our decision-making this year. Uh, as we think about the community, which is what attracted me to Heathwood, uh, the safety of our students, um, in some ways, this very difficult situation we're in, which is really desiring to be back on campus, and also having a tremendous amount of fear and anxiety about that very wish. Um, and so as we, we make these decisions to move forward, um, 
They have been time consuming. They've been thoughtful. Uh, they have involved deep discussion. And I'm just always grateful that I have such a supportive team around me. Chris, you often talk about the word resilience as it relates to um, our family and our experiences and the faculty. Could you just maybe share with them what you have shared with me about the idea of resilience and the importance of that as we're moving forward? Well, I've tried to, I think resilience is a great way to frame it because it reminds me that this isn't something that the Heathwood administrators are going through or that the Heathwood, the school is going through. All of our families, are their resilience is being tested. Um, I have three boys, as Suzanne mentioned. Uh, they have been home since March 16th. And the three of them have not seen a friend in three and a half months. That is a difficult situation for any child. Um, I don't know what that would have been like for me. Um, our families have been at home with their, their job situation has changed. Uh, their relationship with their children is different. Mine is certainly. I've eaten a lot of dinners with my, with my children. Uh, and I think resilience is a way um, that allows us to stay grounded in the fact that all of us are experiencing this. And all of us, I think, are feeling a great sense of stress and anxiety. And there's a lot of unknown. And so it takes resilience. And then we're trying to craft a program uh, upon return or upon the challenges that may come uh, that will kind of recognize the resilience that many of you have shown these past three months. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to dive a little bit deeper, Chris, about resilience and the idea of um, all the issues surrounding COVID-19. I know that we have that on our minds every day. We all wake up in the morning thinking about it and we go to bed thinking about it if you work at Heathwood Hall. But can you please share with us a little bit about the process um, and the team that you've put together to make decisions and specifically what does the timeline look like for us to communicate more with our families? What should we expect in the next few weeks? Um, families are prepping to come back to school in August. Could you maybe share a little bit of what you're thinking as we move forward? You know, I'm glad you referred to the team because it has been a team effort. The board has been an amazing source of support through this as these challenges have reached kind of beyond uh, the, the fences of the school. Uh, and, and they are kind of they are challenges. Um, I have a great administrative team. I've been blessed uh, to land here at this moment uh, with the people I call my teammates or my colleagues, uh, ranging from those on the senior admin team to those in the classroom, uh, to those who work the grounds. It really kind of takes a, a group effort uh, to pull this all together. Uh, from the get-go, when we kind of disbanded in early March, uh, the safety of the kids and our families was at the forefront. And I also shared with my team that this was not just a logistical challenge, kind of shifting to remote learning, but it was also kind of a psychological challenge that I think everybody was experiencing this differently, even within houses. Uh, siblings would experience the remote learning process or the quarantine process very differently. Uh, we had students who thrived while they were at home and, and we had others who struggled. Um, and it, it wasn't their fault, it, it just, it tapped different uh, it just had different strengths and weaknesses and challenges, and it was, just, it was just hard. So we always were trying to craft our communications to recognize that, that this was, that everybody was experiencing this differently. Um, as we move forward, um, what's been difficult is that the, the scenarios have been changing from well, we'll definitely be back, we'll have a, it will definitely kind of slow down in the summer and we won't see an increase in rates until late in the fall. That has changed. Um, from this, we, we definitely have to be back. And then today, Harvard just canceled classes for the year. There'll be no on-campus classes for the whole year. That's challenging uh, to kind of develop a program. But our, our, our June 5th communication uh, began to outline some of that. We have another kind of substantive communication coming out on Thursday, uh, which will update you. Uh, there'll be a video portion and there'll also be a letter. And then there'll be more updates after that following from me. Uh, following from the division heads. Uh, we're also going to be organizing kind of town halls for each grade level with the division heads later. Um, and, and I, you know, ask you to you know, stay aware of, of those possible communications. Uh, but as we kind of hone in, we have really identified that there are kind of 
five things that are, are going to be significant aspects of our plan, which are part of our plan. Um, you know, one is the use of masks, which continue uh, to be kind of proven by data to be the most effective way of uh, slowing the transmission. Uh, physical distancing, uh, CDC is recommending six feet and the American Association of Pediatrics just came out with three feet uh, as a way to uh, leverage risk and mitigate risk while also looking at practicality. Uh, personal hygiene, wash, you know, hand washing, um, sanitization of facilities. And then this fifth piece, which you'll hear me allude to, is kind of uh, almost like personal responsibility. Uh, our students spend a significant amount of time away from our campus. Um, and the decisions that families make away from campus, along with the four legs of the table that I just described, I think are going to play a role in how, he, how the Heathrow community uh, is able to show resilience uh, and strength uh, with, with COVID-19. Chris, I'd love to ask you some specific questions that were given to us by families. Um, one question that was submitted is, could you please tell us about measures that are being taken to increase hygiene, prevent infection, specifically in early childhood and lower school, hand washing, distancing, and masks? What plans are being made to the physical campus to address those issues? Well, a whole host of things and adjustments will continue over the next five weeks. But, um, you know, looking at where students are dropped off and how we control those drop offs is going to be an aspect of that physical distancing that will range from moving the desks uh, six feet apart, which has affected the kind of quantity or the number of students in a class to kind of altering uh, attendance at lockers such that uh, certain groups will go to their lockers at certain times to uh, not seating students in the dining commons really for lunch and specifically in the middle and upper school having a grab and go and in the lower school uh, having those lunches delivered. Um, we, we, we started practicing kind of personal hygiene processes last spring um, and, and in the lower school, in the middle school, uh, we had refined those and are working on creating more can washing stations in the upper school uh, where some of the facilities uh, do not necessarily, are not necessarily passively as easy to use as some of the facilities in the middle school and the lower school. Uh, masks certainly will be a, a, a different way of interacting. Those of you who have been out and about since the passing of the, uh, the Columbia and the Richland County mask ordinance uh, have spent more time in a mask maybe than you did earlier in the spring. Um, and you know that that could be difficult. And I think it is going to be a challenge for our students, but I think it will is, is, is something that you know, kids are resilient, they're adaptable, um, and they will adjust to this. I think also because they so desperately wanna see their friends um, and be in a social community. Thank you. Margaret, you jump in any time, but I'm going to keep on going unless I see you. Yeah, right I will. Chris, could you talk a little bit about what conditions need to be like for campus to open, to reopen safely, and what conditions would lead to a transition back to remote learning? So that's, a, that's actually a difficult question to answer because uh, mm -hmm. one of the things I've seen um, is the, the different way in which people are experiencing um, the, the, the data uh, with COVID. Um, those who look at the, the younger people at such low risk, uh, but also recognizing that we have 27 employees who teach who are over 60 and that kind of conflict uh, there with those people being at higher risk. Um, what the, you know, what's going on in the state, which is often presented as a monolithic data pool, but really from county to county and town to town, there are really different things going on in different age groups. Um, we certainly see recently um, the, the rush to return to bars and restaurants with the 20 to 30 crowd has driven aspects of the data surge and some of those uh, that opened maybe a little sooner than some might have thought was, was, was most prudent. Um, we plan to open right now. Um, I think there usually is a two or three week lag in the data. I'm hopeful that uh, aspects of the mask ordinance, aspects of some thoughtfulness. We'll, we'll see some data changes um, in the next two or three weeks. Um, if the governor issues a stay-at-home order, uh, Heathwood doesn't necessarily have a choice in the matter at that point. Uh, but I was talking to someone earlier, oftentimes when we follow the public schools, we're following them 
because the risk that they're making a call on is the same for us. So if the roads are icy, they're icy for us. Uh, if it's too windy out, it's too windy for us. But if they're making a call because of a particular surge in a data set or the fact that they might have larger classes or more difficult to manage if you're in one building with 800 kids as opposed to 700 kids in 12 or 15 buildings, um, there are some different scenarios. And so I like the fact that we will have some independence uh, from the decision that the public schools will make, but I also know if the state government makes a kind of macro call on, on what we need to do, uh, we will certainly follow there and we'll be able to move into remote learning seamlessly based on what we've learned in the spring. Thank you. Um, can we talk a little bit more about masks for just a minute, masks and face shields? Um, Assuming that the students need to wear masks for all or part of the school day, will there be um, color restrictions? Is it based on the uniform? Is it different for different divisions based on the age of the child? We just walk us through masks and face shields. Yes. So uh, let me cover face shields first. Um, we look at face shields as something that would accompany a face mask. Uh, you know, physicians often uh, maybe you're wearing goggles or a face shield in order pre to prevent droplets from entering their eye sinuses. Um, they're not necessarily used as, a, as an only PPE. Uh, and so you know, we're looking at face masks as the most reliable way to stop the transmission based on data. We do not believe that our twos, threes, and fours, our, our EC students are necessarily capable of wearing masks. Uh, we know that many daycare have opened in, in Columbia uh, where those younger students have not been wearing a mask. We do think our students, K, uh, kind of kindergarten up through 12th grade, have that ability, and we plan to enforce that. We have ordered uh, five masks for every student. Um, he, you know, Heathwood colors, white, green, blue, and some gray. Uh, but we're also, I've also learned during the time that I've been wearing masks is that they can often be very specific in their fit. And while our intention really was to enforce Heathwood colors. I think one of the things that's been great about Heathwood is we, we want kids to be comfortable. We want them to be in a learning environment where they feel comfortable. So I think where the nuance is gonna enter is th there may be that a family finds a mask that really fits their child well, and uh, the, the child feels comfortable in that mask, but they're not able to find the color that they would like that happens to be a Heathwood color. Uh, to me, that would be an easy discussion. I think what we don't want to have the masks become is a distraction. Um, and I think there are ways that masks could be a distraction. Uh, I'm a big Rolling Stones fan, but I'm not sure that we need the Rolling Stones tongue on a, on a face mask. I think that could be a distraction. I'm probably dating myself right now. Um, but I, but I, I, I could go on and on. I'm a Celtics fan. I don't know that many would find that distracting um, unless you were a Knicks fan. Uh, but I, I think we're going to try to use our judgment and we would like to supply families with Heathwood colors, but also recognize that I think face masks can be a very personable fit, kind of a personal fit to your face. And ultimately, I want students to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. So we didn't talk about this necessarily, but I feel confident that um, you're going to have a great answer that I will love. But <laughs> when we, like, we do want our kids to feel comfortable at school because we feel like when they're physically safe and emotionally safe, they're going to have their best experience with their academics. And so what does that look like from a mental health standpoint with regard to the virus? We have three amazing um, certified school counselors that do great work with kids. Can you just talk to us a little bit about what that's going to be like for students and families? Because that's an important part of, um, you know, coming back together. You said beginning of the conversation, it was logical. What is the counseling team? How are they going to help us? Well, I think what I've asked the counseling team to do is to figure out how they can help us help the children and help the families. I think your question was, how is that going to ha How is that going to feel? I don't necessarily know how it's going to feel. I think engaging with parents to tell us how we're doing, but I think what we what we think we know is that this is going to be difficult for children uh, to come back and have rules, uh, many physical distancing rules. I have been telling people are kind of anti-kid, right? They're, they're just the opposite of what it means uh, to, to be young and to be a child where you're close with your friends, uh, you're interacting with your teachers in a more kind of intimate way. Um, 
you just want to be around people. And I think as we get older, it's easy to forget that kids are like that. They are very clingy. So this is going to be a difficult adjustment. So, you know, I think early on, someone maybe asked me, you know, are, are you going to be punishing kids? And I guess I don't want to look at it from that perspective necessarily, but kind of think about it. Like, how can we help kids adjust to this new normal that I think is challenging many of us? wise people who have accumulated a variety of life experiences are finding this very difficult and kind of energy sapping. Uh, I, I think our children are going to find that uh, it's going to be very similar for them. So the counselors from, from interacting with them to helping them to train them, to train our faculty, to train our faculty, to be understanding about the kids, you know, they're teachers and they know that it can be difficult for kids to learn sometimes. This is going to be learning a new skill for them that maybe they've been developing while they've been away from here, but not in an environment where they're used to different rules. You know, we always fall into bad habits when we go back to our old stomping grounds. Well, this is their stomping ground and they're not used to this new normal. So we are going to need to support them through advisory, through teacher-student relationships, through division heads, through counselors, through our school chaplain, and we really wanna be here for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I know as a division head that we have spent a lot of time talking about logistics, right? Where to drop off, how to pick up, how to rotate lockers, stagger lunches, hand washing. What do we do with backpacks? No detail has gone unaddressed. Um, but we had a question from a mom who said um, she would like to know a little bit more about arriving at school and getting into classrooms particularly with the middle and the upper school with regard to changing classes, because we can't cohort in the same way in the middle and upper school as we might be able to do in the early childhood and lower school. So could you talk a little bit about the data that we understand from cohorting and what that means for the different divisions, please? So there's a lot there and I'll try to cover that <laughs> briefly. I think from a, from a drop-off standpoint, you know, we are planning to move EC drop-off to behind the EC building to the gravel parking lot. We are enlarging the gravel parking lot and kind of creating different lanes so that the EC families can drop off behind the Averett Center um, and kind of have a handoff there. We'll be asking our lower school families probably to use the carpool. Um, I know there are some families in the habit of occasionally using that front circle um, or, you know, using the parking lot. And we have to figure out the kind of balance between them bringing their children here. Luckily, we have a lot of outdoor space, which is where we are the safest we know from the transmission of COVID uh, to then kind of facilitating some of that handoff. The middle school is well constructed for controlled drop-offs. And so, but we have to fine tune some aspects of that. We feel really good about that. And the upper school presents, you know, there's an aspect of that that presents some challenges as many of those students are kind of independent and are driving to school. And so, you know, there are some aspects of this where kind of practicality and reality and theory are, are going to bump heads and, and we're looking to iron out some of those, de those details in the next five weeks. Um, as far as m movement um, in the middle school, um, the, the kids spend a lot of time with the people in their, with the students in their grade. So in some ways we're devising plans to keep fifth grade together, keep sixth grade together, keep seventh grade. Um, but there is an aspect of that experience where there might be changes in a cohort based on say a math placement or maybe a choice of foreign languages. Mm -hmm. um, we're also gonna be changing the way we look at PE, the entrances and exits I'll use maybe to get to lunch as we maybe don't wanna walk through the same parts of the building. And the purpose of that control is to, uh, if there is an infection or an exposure, that maybe we've limited some of that because one of the questions we get frequently is if, if something happens in the fifth grade, what does that mean for the sixth grade? Or if something happens in the middle school building, what does that mean for the upper school division? And we're hopeful that the, the number of buildings we have and the fact that many of our students are separated will give us some flexibility uh, dealing with that. But there are some aspects of cohorting, for example, in the upper school that would be very difficult. Uh, teaching a chemistry class, for example, you know, requires the use of the gas outlets and the water and the lab tables uh, that makes aspects of, of having the chemistry teacher move around to meet their students difficult. So there will be more movement in the upper school, though we're looking to control aspects of that movement. 
So that brings me to a follow-up question about, um, you know, I got to ask you some (laughs) follow-up questions. Prepare your heart, right? (laughs) Um, We talked a little bit about the nurse and we've added a nurse and the location of that office and triage and how, how we're changing things a little bit that way. Well, during a normal school year, uh, Kristen Carton, our lead nurse, is busy, um, very busy with, you know, we have sa- over 700 students. Uh, students get sick, they bump a head, they, scra- they scrape a knee, or a young kid has tummy hurts. Um, and so recognizing that, that COVID was going to present a different challenge for us, uh, increased communication with parents, maybe fielding calls, uh, providing expert advice, kind of handling a nuanced situation. Um, we have hired a second nurse this year, someone who's, who's very familiar with Heathwood. Uh, and, and we think that that support of a, a longtime practicing nurse and also the teamwork, I often think, you know, the, 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 some of the parts sometimes are, are, are more so than just the individual aspects of those parts. And so I'm excited uh, for Deb and Kristen to, to team up uh, to provide uh, kind of strong support during this difficult time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so lots of details that we're focusing on, which can kind of feel overwhelming at times. But, um, Chris, you you alluded to the team. Um, Who is really helping you and how does the school and the board of trustees work in tandem uh, to think alongside one another and to be together and making decisions? Can you tell us a little bit about the board's responsibilities versus the school's? But, you know, oftentimes the board is is really focused on looking kind of five to 10 years out, right? Strategically, where is the school going to be in the future? But this particular challenge is one, is such an enormous challenge that it requires the participation of the board. We have moved from meeting six times a year to really meeting monthly. Our executive committee um, has almost started meeting in some cases bi-weekly which means every other week in this case, not twice a week. Um, And and they have been incredibly supportive. It's, you know, frequently I'm talking to Margaret and Freeman Belser, who are the chair and the vice chair. Often uh, the executive committee is someone I interact with frequently. And whether it's from the, the, the financial impact of this on a school, whether it's the kind of community and how this is impacting the, the greater community, um, the board has been helpful. And so I have appreciated their support. They have been supportive every year I've been the head, but I think this year has been a, this, at least the spring and the summer thus far, uh, has been a different challenge. Obviously, it's unprecedented. We've used the term, it's been overused, uh, but it's true. Um, and so I have appreciated having kind of more brains at the table, uh, more experience with the Columbia community, uh, board members with children of different ages with bring, who bring different perspectives to the table. So I have really enjoyed that partnership, and I really think it's been essential uh, to us managing and maneuvering this challenge. Margaret, do you want to jump in? Well, sure. I would, um, I would say the same great things about Chris that he said about the board. Um, the amount of time that Chris and the senior admin in particular have spent over the past several months um, with, you know, what our school and our, our world is facing, it's just incredible. And, and Suzanne, I think you, you said at the beginning that you all are thinking about school when you wake up and you're thinking about school when you go to bed. And that is no exaggeration. I, you know, I'll get a 5.30 a.m. email from Chris Hinchy about something school related. And then, you know, a few hours later, maybe eight o'clock, I'll get a text from Chris. But it's just constant how um, how he's thinking about things and, um, and paying such close attention. And I very much appreciate his approach. He is such a capable head of school in every way, um, which I, I knew before a pandemic arrived. But um, I'll tell you, I've been participating in a number of webinars lately um, about the evolution of school leadership and and how our role has changed with the world that we're living in. And I, I learn regularly that Heathwood is just steps ahead of other schools across the country in terms of where we are in our preparation. And um, it makes me immensely proud of, of our head and of our, our senior admin team who just devote so much time to these decisions that need to be made. And I, I have so much respect for um, for all of you. And Suzanne, I include you in that group. I know you're one of Chris's most trusted confidants, but um, the way you all approach every single decision, not just the decisions of um, 
the past couple of months, but, but every decision is with such care and thought and um, trying to see it from everyone's perspective, not just your own. Um, and the patience with which you all go through the decision-making process. There is, there's no urgency, there's no rush because you're patient to get the information and to arrive at the right answer. So um, it's a pleasure to work with Chris. It's, um, and it's fun to, to watch you all as a group in action. You're, you're such a great team in the way that you support each other and you, you work together. Um, it's a pleasure. Thank you. I think we have a good time. There's one thing that I think we're enjoying in our time together. Um, so this question is for both you, Margaret, and Chris, but what do you think families can do to support the school? What do you think is the most helpful approach for families to help us get through this? Mm -hmm. Well, sorry, Chris, I'm going first. You go. Uh, I would say number one is to be confident and trust our leadership. Um, you might only get a letter on June 5th and then not again until July the 9th, but there is so much work going on every single day to figure out what is right for our campus and um, have faith and, and please understand um, just how careful and thoughtful and wise our leadership is and, and they will get it right. Um, I think it's, it's helpful to voice your concerns in constructive ways and to send emails and, um, you know, let Chris and your division heads know what's on your mind and what your concerns are, but chances are they've already thought of it and they're already working on a solution. That's a great response. And so some of this will be repetitive. Um, feedback is great. Uh, I think, you know, we, we did three surveys this spring on remote learning and each of them uh, helped us get a little bit better, uh, teased out different aspects of the experience. Uh, as we, you know, we really dug into those responses, it was just so interesting to see um, how different the experience could be. I mean, the, the majority of people, it, it went well, um, but I think, you know, to be fully candid, there, there were some for whom it didn't work as well. Um, and I think um, I, I do not shy away from admitting that because I think that allows us to kind of dig in and ask some you know, reflective questions about how we can be better. But I also have really evaluated that, which is most people knew what they were getting uh, when they got an on-campus Heathwood experience. And when remote learning happened, it really just, it, it was a paradigm shift. And for some, that paradigm shift landed in a place that people were reasonably comfortable with. And in other cases, it was a paradigm shift that, that, that didn't. So feedback is helpful. Um, I would say that sometimes a personal email or a, a reach out, a phone call, uh, and a conversation is welcome. Um, it, yeah, it can be more time consuming for both of us to have that conversation. Um, but often, you know, hearing someone's voice, answering the nuanced questions uh, allows us to kind of reach a point of understanding to figure out, you know, what is practical and reasonable moving forward? And, and is there can we find some middle ground on the solution to this problem? Um, I think though this particular challenge, how you are going to best support us is through uh, some sacrifice at home. Um, you know, I, I think there's an aspect of this that reminds me of World War II food rationing and resource rationing, which is that, you know, small changes in your behavior away from campus in the evening on the weekends, mm -hmm. though each one individually isn't necessarily going to turn the tide on COVID collectively, you know, that limiting that tablespoon of sugar or that tire or that aluminum foil to continue the comparison <laughs> with, with the World War II rationing does make a huge difference. And so if, you know, all 500 plus of our families are really being thoughtful, and I know how hard that is, right? I have spent a lot of time with three boys in the house telling them to put their dishes in the sink when the dishwasher is right next to the sink. Um, I know that it's not easy uh, to do those things, but I do think it's gonna help us uh, kind of reach the finish line in one piece, or at least it's gonna feel a little bit easier than maybe it could uh, if we're all working together. And that's been the part of this community that has always blown me away is the degree to which people really do throw an oar in the water and help. Mm -hmm. So I think back to the middle of March when we made the decision that we were going to go 
remote for a little bit. And we thought it was like 10 days and it ended up being, you know, 10 weeks. And I remember thinking like, I'll just leave the plants in the middle school building on the shelf because we'll be back in a few days and it'll be fine. Well, we need new plants, but <laughs> talk a little bit about the faculty because I felt honored to lead the middle school faculty and those are just some amazing people. And the school is filled with amazing faculty members. Um, have you done any thinking or reflection about the teachers and what they did to, you know, we often call it moving the aircraft carrier, like turning a ship around. Um, talk a little bit about the faculty. They were incredible. Yeah, I was blown away with our faculty. I mean, I, realized, I remember on March 9th, we had been service day schedule. And on March 9th, that Monday, it was really becoming apparent that we were likely going to go remote at some time. It seemed to be where the, the kind of momentum of the country was going. Um, and, you know, we uh, allocated a day to do some professional development. Um, John Caballero and his tech team and the division heads dug in and just did an amazing job. Uh, but the teachers uh, really, you know, after many of them spending years honing a specific craft, like teaching in person is a craft and to, to, to read kids and to know how to present something to them differently, to then have that paradigm shift and to be online was really learning a new skill and the degree to which they jumped in and continually improved. And then the passion and energy at the end of a very long year to spend three full days doing professional development to get ready for the potential of being fully remote, which we don't know if we will be fully remote, like the whole school remote, um, was humbling. And so, you know, I always say I feel blessed to, to be leading the school because I always think that uh, to lead, people need to give you permission to lead. And, and so to a large degree, our faculty have either given permission to their division heads or me, or maybe a trusted colleague, uh, but many of them led in, uh, by themselves in a class, in a particular discipline, or in a division. And I really couldn't be prouder of, of what our faculty did and know that at the end of the year, they were tired uh, from teaching the kids with passion and kind of doing the best job they could. Thank you. Um, I'd love to ask you a question from a parent that was submitted. Um, the last question about COVID. If the school doesn't plan to offer remote options, can you help us to understand why, maybe what that looks like on campus versus remote? Um, when many public school districts across the state have announced plans that they're able to do that out of an abundance of caution, what does that look like for Heathwood? So for Heathwood, and as it does many other private schools, it comes down to a question of resources. So if we're on campus, fully on campus, or at least the majority of our students are on campus, we're going to offer our, our a robust Heathwood experience on campus. If we are remote, meaning a whole grade, or maybe it's a grade level team, second grade, or maybe it's a division, depending on what it looks like, which is hard to predict, we will offer a better version of last year's remote. And there's a number of changes that we've made to our remote learning, some of which we'll share in the letter on Thursday, and some of which will be shared more specifically with division heads. I think the area that presents difficulty is this idea of being able to offer both a robust on-campus experience and a robust remote learning program at the same time. And I guess what, what I will tell people is, both of those programs, the remote and the on-campus, are incredibly time-consuming endeavors which our faculty are able to do. It's really hard to do both uh, to offer. So like putting a camera up and streaming a class, that's not remote learning, right? That's just giving a, someone a window into your classroom. And there are many cases in which just live streaming isn't practical and isn't necessarily best practices. Uh, and so we do recognize that we will be dealing with kind of an aspect of being away from school. Maybe a student's been exposed or maybe a family member has COVID and that family needs to kind of quarantine for 14 days or 10 plus three, depending on the test results. Um, and so we'll be able to support them as we have when a student has had bronchitis or has had a concussion and maybe been out for two weeks. Uh, and so there will be different ways to support families and, and we're looking to do it both through technology but also through the use of counselors, 
uh, our associate teachers, advisors, division heads, uh, to be able to, because what we've seen is that when when students are away, just live streaming the material doesn't necessarily do the job. There also has to be a fair amount of interaction with the teacher. Uh, you know, my son's taking an online class this summer. We offered 10 and he's one of you know 95 students, but he's had an amazing experience taking geometry. And I've been amazed at the ability of either through lessons with the teacher, through asynchronous worksheets, and then through technology kind of exercises. He has had a uh, really a really good experience this summer. Um, and so we're building on a lot of that and we're going to call that connected learning where we're staying connected to learners who have been pulled away from campus uh, through an exposure and infection. Or we will also have kids get normal sicknesses this year and we'll be able to employ that uh, as a new arrow in our quiver. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, I want to change topics for just a minute. Um, one of the things we're most proud of, I think, at Heathwood is that we were founded in 1951, um, intending to welcome all people to the campus. And rooted in that Episcopal tradition is that we very much value the dignity of every human being. And we work very hard to see the grace of God in everyone that we come into contact with. Um, and the world is in a crazy time in some ways. And so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what that means for us on campus and for Heathwood. How is the school going to continue that work of the Episcopal tradition that we believe so strongly in? So so we have been in uh, lots of discussions, kind of, you know, we haven't been with our people. Uh, our families are not here. So, you know, I had started discussions with Willis back in the fall about really changing the focus of, of his position, which was the diversity coordinator that was coupled with coaching responsibilities, teaching responsibilities, advising responsibilities, and community service responsibilities to really focus on um, this direct, uh, director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and then we broke in March, just as we had finished his new job description and these different threads of connecting better with our alums, uh, doing a better job at creating a more diverse kind of uh, workforce, faculty, staff, uh, to interact with our and bring broader perspectives to our students, uh, to work with division heads, to better embed the reality and the broad perspective of experience of a variety of people in our country over the, the centuries that have passed, so that that perspective would allow people to think more critically about how the past has informed the present. Um, and we broke on March 16th. And so you know, the first challenge was remote learning and our families. And then Willis and I kind of took back up that conversation at the end of April, early May. Uh, and then, you know, things in this country heated up. Um, and so uh, those discussions on campus have, have picked up pace. We have um, had conversations with alums. We've had uh, kind of increased uh, kind of written communications with some of our alums. We've uh, reached out to our African African American families to check in on kind of how our we doing as a school and how are you doing as a family um, at our school? Um, we are talking to division heads about ways to uh, look critically in an age appropriate way at aspects of our curriculum to make sure that it is uh, a fair portrayal of, of, of what has happened uh, in our history so that students can think critically of all the different experiences uh, that the American people have had. Um, and this summer, uh, some of our faculty and staff are have a choice of, of reading one of five books, which I mentioned in a letter that went out, um, just as a way, not as a piece that would inform curriculum, but just as a way of having faculty reflect on their perspective and ask themselves, am I being as aware as I should of all those experiences around me. So the books really were about an adult discussion, um, how we interact with children and students in the classroom uh, really is a different discussion and schools and changing curriculum takes time um, as you wanna vet and be very careful and thoughtful uh, about how you do that um, in a way um, that accomplishes the goal, which as I've said again, again, it's just to broaden the perspective and the appreciation of the of the variety of experiences out there. And I think we sometimes take for granted. One of the books I read really drove home the point that, you know, you take for granted your experience growing up in your family community, that that's everybody's experience. And so mm -hmm. growing up in Norwich, Connecticut, as a Irish Catholic kid, uh, I assumed everybody had that experience and everybody didn't. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and so uh, it's important that I bring that to bear as an administrator at Heathwood. So before I ask you the final question, because I can't believe the time has flown by, um, is there any question or topic that I haven't asked you about that you would like to address? I'm going to let Margaret take that because I'm sure there's some topics that you'd like to jump in on. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would like to give a shout out to the entire board. Um, the board is 26 strong, brilliant minds, and um, they have given a great deal of time, particularly in the past couple of months with um, Google Meets. We've all learned how to do, many of us, myself included, have had to get our children to teach us, but um, I really appreciate all of them um, stepping up and, and being involved. I think we've had 100% participation at every meeting we've needed to have. And it is just a group of really um, wonderful folks who represent our constituents very well. And um, and it's a privilege to, um, to be the chair of that group of people. Um, we have very serious work ahead of us. Our responsibility is to steward the school to long-term sustainability and to be responsible for the fiscal health of the school, which is um, quite a challenge in these um, times that we're in. But um, it's such a group, great group of folks, um, and the school is in super leadership hands. So um, I did want to give that shout out to the board. Um, I had one other thought and I've lost it. Let me think. What was it? I think it may have just been about the, um, the fiscal health of the school. Suzanne, you asked earlier what um, parents can do to help. And in addition to trusting the school, I think to continue to support the school and to understand that, um, for example, um, it's incredibly expensive to prepare Heathwood to be um, COVID ready for students. And those are not things that we anticipated in our school budget, but they're very costly. And so we need the school to continue uh, to receive the support of families in every way that they can. Um, so that, that would just be a second answer to your original question about what we can do to, um, to be supportive, but also to know that the school is in excellent, excellent hands um, with our current leadership, Liz Summers, knows our books backwards and forwards and, and has figured out how to make it all happen. And, um, and our, so a challenge for the board right now really is um, to be operating both short term. Um, we're back to looking at next school year and trying to help plan um, for that. Generally, we have already done the planning for the next, you know, for the, the coming school year and we're, we're on to this, the year after. So we're sort of um, taking a step back and looking at, um, different budget scenarios for next year and so forth. Um, but also continuing to look long-term at our, um, our campus and what our facilities needs might be. Um, very exciting things ahead for the school. And it's just, um, it's really thrilling to be a part of um, a school that is so capable and nimble to be able to continue in such a strong way um, to, to provide an education for students. Um, just in the blink of an eye, how quickly things changed and how, how we were able to adapt to that. I think you know, some of the other details, I'll just, you know, maybe cover a couple other things that people might be curious about. You know, so, some of the things that I really value about an independent school education are things that are going to be incredibly challenging this year. Um, I went over into the chapel the other day and moved around all the chairs to see what it would look like if you just sat enough people to be six feet apart and um, 56 people can fit in the chapel. But then the question is, do you want 56 people six feet apart in the chapel? Uh, what about the soft fabric? Uh, do you need to bring in hard chairs or do you reduce it to maybe 35? And experiencing chapel is a key part of a Heathwood experience. So do we move the chapel under a building? Uh, do we have people watch it live stream, which we plan to do? Uh, all of those things will be alterations. In the upper school, school meetings and the middle school town hall are things that we will not will not look the same. Um, in our theater, which seats 250 people, you can sit 28 groups of three appropriately distanced. But then do you want 23 groups of three people in a room or not? Um, are, you know, will we be using our gyms differently? Will it be used for PE? Will we have all our PE outside or will it be overflow 
uh, for options uh, to eat meals during inclement weather when we're trying to spread kids out all over campus uh, into different places. And, uh, you know, one of the things that was a huge and enormous part of my high school, and, and luckily, you know, I went to a small enough school that it was also part of my college experience, um, was athletics. Uh, athletics formed me. I remember playing Little League Baseball uh, by the time I was in kindergarten and then playing basketball uh, up until I was 21, 22. And uh, we're not sure about what the athletic season looks like right now. Uh, we know we're training, uh, but we haven't necessarily gotten a full green light from Skisa about what interscholastic sports will look like. And that, that that's a hard thing for me. I was a coach for many years and, you know, some of my most memorable moments as a teacher uh, as an adult, uh, when I was young, I, I looked pretty young. I looked younger than this, uh, were as a coach. And so to think about those moments not being able to happen, this is just such a unique and challenging year um, that, you know, I have had to suspend after this, is, this will be my 30th year in, in independent schools, suspend what I think should happen or what I expect to happen or what as an educator I'm entitled to have happen. Uh, it really is going to require us to be nimble, flexible, understanding. And please know that, you know, I have a, I have a child at home who's slightly higher risk. Um, we are thinking deeply about the, mm -hmm. the safety and well-being of your children. And we know that being on campus is part of that. Like that is a key component of a kid's childhood, right? Is that being with their friends, but also uh, the, the, the transmission of this virus, which we know for the most part, kids seem safer, but then there are those instances where we hear of stories where, where a kid does not react that way to, to the infection, um, and, and we need to work as hard as we can to mitigate that risk, and, and that's what we're spending um, many 5.30 in the morning mornings uh, thinking about. Uh, I just happen to be a morning person. I go to bed earlier, uh, but I, I do know that that we are here for you. And uh, all of us on the senior admin team are really open to your feedback um, and, and eager to serve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, this is the final question. It's for both of you. You get a chance to answer it. It's okay. one of my favorite questions. What is it that you love the most about Heathwood Hall? What brings you joy, pride? What is it that you love the most about the special place? Me first. Yeah. I'll go first. Um, Suzanne, one thing the most, that is a hard question. Um, mm -hmm. but I'm going to go with community. Um, Hugh and I chose Heathwood for our boys as a place not only to get their education, but as a place to grow up. I mean, they are literally growing up as Heathwood students on the campus. And it's the people for us. It is the faculty. It's the staff. Um, it's, it's it is everybody who's there it's the families it's the their friends they are learning how to be good people and so that's it for me is the community yeah, i'm gonna be very unoriginal and it is it's the same thing for me um before i came to heathwood and those of you who have been in this admissions office who've been in my office in the admissions office have heard me tell this story but i you know working at a boarding school you are looking to create a community in which children kind of are, are de they, they develop in almost just by being in the community, by being around adults, by being in an environment that supports them developing and kind of nudging them in the right direction. Um, but I was ready for a challenge, a different challenge in, in 2013, 2012, and, and started looking at some new opportunities and, and wanted to be at a co-ed school, wanted to be at a day school and, and really did want to be in a different area of the country. And when I visited Heathwood, and I ended up here in a roundabout way uh, through a connection through Oregon, through someone had, who had interviewed me, who had worked at Heathwood, uh, I really was blown away by the community and the degree to which uh, teachers and coaches were just at events with kids and knew kids and interacted with kids. And uh, it, it, there are so many examples of when it was really clear, but one of my favorite stories is, is back to the flood is driving around with Susanna Cook. Um, I ended up kind of partnered up with her as we were driving around Columbia, delivering meals or checking in on people. And if Susanna's on right now, she, she's amazing. And those of you who know her know she has an energy about her. Um, but the, the degree to which the families we were going to help 
wanted to figure out how they could help other families. And that was just, mm-hmm. you know, part of the Heathwood community. And so I could go on and on, but my boys have been shaped by the community here uh, in a way that, that, will always be with me because if you're a parent and you see your kids shaped, right, that really has, it means a lot to you. And so uh, I'm grateful for Heathwood and I'm grateful that I ended up here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I want to say thank you to Margaret. I know that you're joining us from um, out of town with your family and Chris, thank you um, for joining us tonight and for having a great conversation about our beloved Heathwood Hall I want to make sure I say thank you to Sarah Hughes for making arrangements for tonight for us to be able to share. It was such a great opportunity to tell families all the things that we've been thinking about and talking about and planning. Um, I feel great pride in the work that we're doing for our families, and it was a great opportunity to be able to share that. So I want to um, say thank you to the families. I think we had almost 150 families who were Wow. Um, online. And so we look forward to continuing to share the great news coming out of South Beltline with all of you. Absolutely. This was a great success. So I hope that we'll be able to continue these conversations and and give families just another opportunity to to see what we're doing with students and um, just surrounding our children with amazing adults to help raise them and shape them into great people who have um, incredible futures in front of them. So I want to invite everybody to come to campus soon when it's safe. You got to wear your mask, but we we'll have you um, and to share the good news of Heathwood Hall. So thank you both for being here and thanks to Sarah for making arrangements. Thanks, Suzanne. Everybody. Thanks, Margaret. All right. Thank you. Good night. Nice okay. okay. Bye-bye. Thanks, Suzanne. Thanks, Margaret. All right. Thank you. Good, Good night. night. Okay. Bye-bye.